I want to preach a message, talk to you, if I may. Everyone say, if God be for us. Shout those words at me. If God be for us. And I want to subtitle this message, I Choose God. Just say that with me. I choose God. Now, Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. How many of you are thankful for Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28? How many of you know that all things, the good, the bad, the ugly, it's all working, amen? And then verse number 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse number 30 says, Moreover, whom he did, he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And of course, our focus this past month has been this verse, number 31, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? If God be for us, then who can be against us? Set your Bibles down and join hands with the person standing next to you and let us pray. Lord, we thank you, first of all, for this day that you have made. We rejoice, we are glad in it. You've already spoken to us today, God, but we ask you to continue to speak this morning as we bring our hands Together, we also bring our hearts and our minds and our spirits into one accord. You said that wherever we touch and we agree that you would be there. And we believe that you are here in this place. You are here to speak. You're here to heal. You're he here to save, here to deliver. You are here to do those things that only you are capable of doing, God. And I ask your love, your healing, your comfort, your peace, your power your voice to go to work in this place now and do those things that only you are capable of doing. We thank you that you are here. You are mighty. You are exalted. You are the one, the true, the only living God. We lift you up in this place. We ask you for an open heaven. We ask you for an exchange between heaven and earth today. We thank you that those things are happening even now. Father, now I die, I ask you to speak through me and allow your Holy Spirit to say to these, your precious people, what you would desire. In the precious name of Jesus, and everyone said amen and amen. Let's put our hands together and give them praise one more time. Amen. Look at someone and ask them, if God be for us, then who can be against us? Now look at one more person and tell them, I choose God. And I choose God and then you can sit down this has been a loud week <laughs> it's been loud the venues the avenues uh, the options we have I'll just say that to voice ourselves in this day and age this world has never seen anything like it before and the volume certainly got turned up this week in this nation. Uh, you know, there are a few weeks out of every year that you kind of know what you're going to get when you go to church. Um, because they're already written out on the music sheet. You know, Christmas, you know what you're going to get at Christmas. You're not going to go to church on Christmas and hear the preacher prayerfully not preaching about the crucifixion of Jesus. And you're not going to go to church on Easter, prayerfully not, and, and hear the preacher preaching about the birth of Jesus or Moses parting the Red Sea. You pretty much know what you're going to get uh, on these days of the year. And then, of course, New Year's. There's a few services throughout the year. You know what you're going to get, but... You know, in jazz music, some of you guys don't know I'm a musician, but there's this word called syncopation. 
And syncopation is an irregular beat. And uh, it's irregular because it does not fall right with the rest of the beats on the chart. Uh, but the band knows that it's coming. Uh, and so the entire jazz band might hit on a syncopated beat or note in the music chart. And that's kind of how I look at this week. Like God threw us a syncopated beat on our charts. Because uh, this morning, as Bishop already said that today, uh, you know, every preacher in America, at least 90, 95 percent, I would say, are going to be addressing uh, the elephant in the room. <laughs> I, I even wrote, saw one person said, now I'm not going to be talking about uh, uh, unicorns if there's an elephant standing in the room. And that was a preacher that wrote that. So he kind of uh, confirmed, I think, what everybody already knows. Uh, and of course, it's our obligation, our responsibility, and our duty as pastors, as leaders among the people of God, as voices within the body of Christ to address certain issues, uh, certain decisions, uh, certain acts, uh, tragedies, triumphs, whatever it might be, it is our obligation to address these things. And so, of course, I take my job very seriously and I plan on stepping into that obligation this morning and so with that I'll say that this week our Supreme Court attempted and I have to say not for the first time because this has happened many times before to redefine the words of our supreme deity and we as the people of God at least seem to be caught in a quagmire. And these five justices, even though there are nine total, there were five that voted a certain way, they simply highlighted a chasm that has already existed in this nation for decades. It's not a new topic. It's been in our face on television for years now. It's been discussed in our schoolhouses and every other institution and on our jobs for years now. And so this decision was simply uh, highlighting things that have already existed for a long time. And if nothing else, the volume was turned up on both sides of the fence. Some in celebration, and then there are others that are in an uproar right now. And as believers in Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit field servants of the utmost God, are there any of you in here today? We all want to know how do we respond to this? Or do we respond even? As Bishop so eloquently said, we should respond rather than react. If we are using an living according to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, I have to state the things that I do not believe. These are the things that I do not believe are about to happen. First of all, I do not believe that the doom of God or this nation is doomed. Let me say it like that. I don't believe that we're about to see an outpouring of the wrath and terror of God like we have never seen before in our history. As many are proclaiming now that suddenly America has become Sodom and Gomorrah and this nation is about to burn under the terror and the wrath of an almighty God and we act like suddenly we've opened up the doors and we've uh, woken up the beast so to speak and that this nation is going to burn and we will never be the same again. We'll never be the same again, but not for those reasons. Uh, and let me say this. The reason I believe that is because, again, as Bishop said, and I didn't know he was going to go there, so I won't spend too much time here. But we have legislated far worse things in this nation that would certainly be more deserving of the fury of God. If you didn't know that, then read a history book. Legislation that defined a non-white-skinned person as three-fifths of a human being. Let that sink in. 
legislation that defined a woman as not having the intelligent capacity to cast a meaningful vote. Legislation that took prayer to an almighty God out of our institutions of education. Legislation that said it's okay to kill a living human being so long as that living human being is still inside the womb of another living human being. Or as my little three-year-old nephew says about my, my future baby, I ain't going to tell y'all his name yet because that's just for us right now, but um, little Julia said that he's, he's swimming around. <laughs> he's swimming around inside Auntie Joe's belly, he told his mom. And did you know that he, he drinks the fluids inside of her belly too? And every week I get up, updates from my wife about how, did you know that this week the baby sucks on his thumb and, this, and he can understand your voice now? And she's been teaching me all, I mean everything. Every week I'm getting another lesson about this living human being that is inside of her. And it is still legislated in this country that it's okay to kill that baby because we don't know what it looks like yet. We've only seen the sonogram. But that's another message for another day. But none of this legislation has brought the wrath of God to this nation. Now, you could look around and you could see the devastation that we've walked through from terrorist attacks uh, to major natural disasters and catastrophes. But... You know, Jesus said that these things were just going to happen. He never said that they were going to happen in response to any. In other words, these things were not reactions to anything that he foresaw. But these things were already written into the plan of God. So the things that we're seeing, they, they were, they, they're just happening because they were preordained to happen. That's the way that, that, that Jesus taught us anyway. Uh, so I'll say that many times in this nation, we have deserved the wrath of God. How many of you could say that? Just like many times in our life, we have deserved the wrath of God. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say all of us under the sound of my voice, we probably can't go further than a week. Some of us a day, and then we got real sanctified folks that could maybe press rewind for about four days. But if you go past about four days, all of us have done something that is deserving of the wrath of an almighty God. How many of you understand that clearly? But every time, every single time, we do something. Every single time, something in this nation is legislated set forth in the law, every single time we have been spared of the wrath of God. Think about that. All of the stuff that this nation has been through, all of the decisions that the government has made, and don't forget we're the ones that vote those people into office. That's a, a whole nother discussion. But every single time we are seemingly spared from the wrath of God. Why is this? Well, that's a simple answer. It is because of you and you and you and me and people just like us all over this nation. We are spared the wrath of God. Because there is such a thing that still exists called the people of God. You and I, we are the people of God. And what we are doing this morning is what the people of God are supposed to do. The book of Hebrews teaches us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Especially as we see that day approaching. That is our instruction, that is our encouragement, and everyone that I'm looking at this morning decided to get up this morning, and if you're anything like me, you drank a cup of coffee, but your sole focus today was not to get to lunch, your sole focus today, the reason this day exists 
for about 95% of you is so that you can get to this place at 9 o'clock or 10.30 or whatever it is so that you can see your fellow believers and the family of God and your brothers and sisters in Christ and so that you can lift up your voice and praise God together and worship him together and tell God, God, you are still God over my life. You are still God over my family. You are still God. If I have anything to say about it, I still choose to exalt you. I still choose to get to church. I still choose to assemble myself. I still choose to open up my spirit and my spiritual ears and listen to what you have to say. I still believe that you are living and speaking. And God, there is something that I need to get from you today. If that's why you're here, I want you to take a moment and just give God praise. That's what we're here for. This is Bethel. This is the house of God. This is the place of interaction between heaven and earth. This is the place where heaven speaks to you and you take that instruction from heaven. And you wake up on a Monday morning and you do what God is calling you to do. Can somebody shout hallelujah in this place? And there's people like us all over this nation right now. And so for those people that want to say the wrath of God is coming on this nation, you better take a look at 5820 Northwest Loop Loop 410. You better look at my praise first. You better look at my brother first. You better look at my sister first. I don't care what five people legislated this week. I'm looking at a few hundred people right now that decided to come and worship an almighty and a living God. As we read this morning, Abram said, if you have 10, well, we got a lot more than 10 right now. And so I don't believe that we're doomed. Through all that we've been through as a nation and legislated and allowed to take place under the auspices of our great flag and name, through all of these things, God continued to bless this nation. We're still the wealthiest nation in the world, and we have been almost from day one. We're still the most powerful nation in the world, and I don't care if, you know, let's try to, somebody tries to tamper with it, I'll just say it like that. (laughs) We're still the most powerful nation in the world. People still want to, you know, you don't see people fleeing to live really anywhere else. 99% of the people, when they leave their country, they leave their country to come to this country. There's a reason for that. So no matter what has transpired in this nation, there has always been a remnant of people in this nation. I won't be here much longer. What are we? We are the church of the living God. Who do men say that I am? Some say you're Moses. Some say you're Elijah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. Peter, what about you? I say that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Your name is no longer going to be Simon, but your name is going to be Peter. For upon this rock, I will build my church. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven and Peter I have a plan. I am going to build an institution in this earth called the church. The Old Testament prophets referred to that church as Zion. The prophet Isaiah saw the church established in the last day, established, institutionalized among other establishments and institutions as the chief among all other institutions. So at the end of the day, the church wins. At the end of the day, I win. At the end of the day, you win. Because at the end of the day, the thing that we are a part of always and ultimately wins. Because that's the way that God planned it to be. If you are in this ark, if you are in the body of Christ, if you belong to the church of the living God, then you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Can somebody say amen? Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 19, the apostle Paul says that you are no longer 
strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens, not with your fellow Americans first, not what your last name calls you first, not where you graduated from university first, but you are fellow, fellow citizens first and foremost with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for, for God by the Spirit. The institution of the church has always been and will always be the saving grace of any society. The saving grace of this nation has been the church, the institution of the church. The saving grace of any culture, of any society is always the church and the people of God. How many of you are thankful for the church today and the institution of the church? As a matter of fact, 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, speaking about his people, and we could apply this to the church in this hour, God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, not if my people would get and curse one another out and rant and vent on Facebook and any other, you know, social media outlet they have and text all their friends and tell them that our country is going to hell. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that my people who are called by my name would focus on themselves. If they would humble themselves and pray, if they would turn from their wicked ways, then I will, heal, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's our instruction as the people of God. And that's why we're here today. We're here to say it doesn't matter what anyone else says. We're here, God, because we still belong to you. You are still our God and we are still your people. We are still your people and you are still our God. Can somebody say amen? I don't have time to walk you through scripture and build the case. I'm going to forego this time uh, because I'm going to trust that you already have an understanding that the institution of the church is where you find the people of God. Because in this hour, that is debated some. But I firmly believe and can absolutely prove to you that the institution of the church is where you find the people of God. I'm going to say it one more time because this is important to note before we move further. The institution of the church is where you find the people of God. It is the people of God and it is the institution of the church, listen to me carefully, that has always been the saving grace of this nation. Do we agree on that? Now let's take it a step further, can we? The church is the last institution that we see established in Scripture. The last institution that we see established by God and ordained by God is the institution of the church. If the institution of the church did not exist, then I'd be concerned right now. But thankfully, the institution of the church is still around. We're in it right now. When I say the institution of the church, I mean the order and everything that comes along with it. I'm talking about pastors and prophets and apostles and evangelists and teachers and the functioning of the body of Christ. That is the institution of the church and it is alive and well and kicking in this nation. Can somebody say amen? If that didn't exist, then I'd be concerned. But thankfully it exists. The church is not just the people of God, but it is interestingly defined a few times in Scripture, but I'm going to reference Ephesians chapter number 5, 
for this. The church is referred to as the bride of Christ. Ephesians chapter number 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. Now, who is the husband in a marriage? Anybody? It's not you, is it, Debbie? Okay, I'm just praying it ain't. You the wife, right? And why is that? Because you're a woman. And you're the husband because you're a man. Amen. Amen. Okay. Because we're going somewhere. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body. And is himself its savior. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now this is interesting to me because Paul is voicing what is understood among early believers that the church or the body of Christ is also the bride of Christ. And the way that we are able to articulate the functionality of the relationship between Christ and his church is we look at a marriage. Are y'all with me? Now, what's further interesting to me, Carmen, is that the institution that they are reflecting upon is the very first institution that is established created and ordained by God in Scripture. There's many institutions that we're going to see in Scripture. We're going to see kingdoms, nations, families, all kind of things instituted in Scripture. But there are two bookend institutions that are more important than all the other institutions that we see because these two never had an end according to Scripture. The first institution being marriage between a, a man and a woman. Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman. I'm going to say it again. He made a woman. God made a woman. God didn't make a man that thought he was a woman. God made a woman. And he brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, and this is flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called a woman because she was taken out of man, and therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is the first institution that is ordained by God. This is the first thing that God ever brought into agreement was a man and a woman. Can I just stop right there and let's thank God. As a matter of fact, if you are a man and you have a woman, you ought to look at her and say, I thank God for you. Yeah. Sit down. First institution, a marriage between a man and a woman, last institution, the church, the body of Christ. When looked at, it is viewed as a marriage between Christ and his bride. Whatever is legislated within this nation, there's always what I like to call a ripple effect throughout culture and society. In other words, 
And you have a young man looking at a flag that should have been taken down a long time ago. Reading stuff that should have been burned a long time ago. That was legislated and allowed. That turns around and performs this horrific, tragic event that we talked about last Sunday. But had someone somewhere said, you know what, when we found this nation, all men are created equal. And this evil, this evil is, is not going to exist on this land. Then we would forego much of the hurt and the pain that we saw even as late as last week. Legislation simply closes a door or opens a door. Let me say it again. It either closes a door or it opens a door. For those of us that want to say that certain legislations being passed do not have an effect on our society, look at this nation up to the 1950s when it pertains to obedience to authority order within institutions then in the 1960s prayer to God is taken out of school that's legislated now suddenly you can't tell a five-year-old what to do in the schoolhouse this legislation opened a door to not respect those things which are an authority to us, so to speak. It opens doors and it closes doors. Let me say this. There is a drastic, drastic difference between the act of homosexuality and the institution of marriage. Marriage has little to do with sexuality. Uh, one of the focal points of marriage, obviously and of course, is procreation. Am I right about it? Amen. But there is a drastic difference between this institution of marriage and the act of homosexuality. This is what I've been hearing a lot of. Well, Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. He that's without sin, cast the first stone. The message of the love of Jesus Christ. I don't think I have to go into explaining myself as far as telling you that there's no one that believes and is more proponent of the love and the grace of God more than the man you're listening to right now. I've almost gotten fistfights with people because they want to deny that God is as loving as I'm trying to tell them that he is. <laughs> I mean, I make people mad I talk about. I, as a matter of fact, I talk about the love of Jesus so strongly about five or six years ago in this church that I literally watched entire families get up while I'm teaching and walk out and never come back to this church. Because it is just mind-boggling to people to think that God is as loving as I believe that he is. So no one has been more of a proponent of the love and the grace of God than your pastor. But I'm going to say it again. There's a difference between the act of a sin and an institution. And so the argument of sin or imperfection existing within all of us in relation to the attempt of redefining an institution is weak at best. Let me say it like this. Just because an apple is rotten does not mean that suddenly onions and apples are defined the same way. Also, the interjection of the commandment of love from our Lord Jesus in relation to redefining an institution has no meaningful ground either. Jesus, his greatest instruction of love was to love what? Our enemy. This was his greatest instruction. The hardest thing to do is to love what? Your enemy. But he never told us 
that they were not our enemy. Let's clear the air real quick. Jesus said to love your enemies. He never said you don't have any enemies. I'm going to say it again. He said to love your enemies. He never said when you love them, they won't be your enemies anymore. All he said is to love your enemy. Now, the awareness of an enemy, this is basically what he was saying, is not a green light to attack them. Because you are aware that someone is an enemy, or let's say it like this, is in opposition to you. That is not a green light or an open door for you to attack. Because attacking everything in opposition to us does not get us anywhere. More importantly, it doesn't get them anywhere. Are y'all with me? Love your enemy. But your enemy doesn't suddenly become your best friend because you love them. An enemy at its greatest definition is someone that is against you. That's an enemy at its greatest definition. Something that is anti or against the Apostle Peter speaks that there would be the spirit in the last day of the Antichrist in opposition to or against everything that Christ is or represents. So anything that is anti or opposing is an enemy. And we are to love that thing or that person. What we are not to do, though, and I'm going to get into this now, I'm going to take it a step further, is to accept the enemy redefining the things that God has so clearly defined for us as the people of God. So our president is one of many political voices right now that has urged the body of Christ and Christians across this nation to quote unquote progress or evolve. Now, just like I'm the greatest proponent of love, my dad will tell you I'm also the greatest proponent of progress. No one loves progress or evolution more than your pastor does. But this here, this redefining of a God-created and God-established institution is not progress. It is certainly not evolution. As a matter of fact, it is the complete opposite. It is devolution, not evolution. I feel for anyone in this hour that defines the institution of gay marriage as an evolving or progress. First of all, marriage is not defined by any God as b between a man and another man or a woman and another woman. Not really in any major religion in the world. So it can be our God or a false God, but no God says that that's what marriage is. It doesn't exist. So you have to, t well, hold on, because I'm not finished. And I told my dad I'd write this, but here I go. I'm just going to go ahead and preach it, and then we'll transcribe it. So then you have to turn away from religion and say, well, I'm a progressive humanist. And so I have to, therefore, default to my belief in science and evolution. Well, if you believe in evolution, then you believe in the premise or one of the foundational principles of evolution is survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest is defined as any species that is trying to sustain itself uh, and further itself throughout years to come. For the longest period of time, it can sustain itself. So you tell me, how do you take procreation out of a species and call it progress? How do you take procreation out of any species and call it evolution? So it's anti-science and it's anti-God. It's a lie of the devil. So Pastor Dustin, why are you preaching? Are you, are, are you preaching against the institution of gay marriage? Yes, I am. Now here's, and we're going to talk about what to do here in a minute. 
I'm preaching against it because I had an epiphany this morning. I've been praying to God, and I've been asking God, God, what do we say? Just like every other pastor, prayerfully in this nation. I've really been in deep prayer and deep thought. Can't get it off my mind. And the one thing that struck me as different about this legislation than any other legislation that we've seen in decades past in this nation is its attack on a foundational institution. Because if the government has the ability to redefine the institution of marriage, then why would they not have the power to define the institution that you and I sit in today? If the institution of marriage is defined in such and such a way, then suddenly that book in institution, which is a reflection of the institution of the church in our relationship with our creator, then what are we opening the door to? Now here's what we're not going to do as a church. We're not going to go protest. If I see any of you standing out on the street with some cardboard sign, you go to another church in town, not this church. Because you're going to love everybody. That's what you're going to do. But here's what you're not going to do. You're not going to go home and tell your kids, well, because the Supreme Court says so, that's just the way it is. Just as much as you wouldn't want a white man telling his white son in the 1940s or 50s or any other time before that, well, they're black men, so they're lesser than us because that's the way that the government defines it. And that's our allowance. You wouldn't want that being taught in the home. But the reason things change in this nation is because preachers from the institutions of the church decided to stand up, preachers like Martin Luther King Jr., pastors, and say, you know what? If we're going to make a change in this nation, it's going to take place within the fabric and DNA of the body of Christ because when the institution of the church gets its mind made up about doing anything, then there's nothing that can be done to stop her. You better believe that. You better believe it. You don't vote another president that'll set in another Supreme Court justice and cross your fingers and hope that it happens. You raise a little kid and you tell that little kid from the time they can understand what you're saying, one day you're going to be the president of this nation. One day you're going to be the mayor of this city. One day you're going to be a justice sitting on the Supreme Court panel. One day you're going to be a congressman in office. One day you're going to be a senator. But whatever it may be, I will be dad gummed if you are not going to be a man of God or a woman of God and follow the ways of God. That's how you change a nation. So instead of putting your fingers on your computer and complaining about America's going to hell, you better open the Bible and teach your kids, train your children in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they shall not depart from it. I find it funny that the same people that are complaining are the same people that can't get their wife or their kid or their husband to get up and go to the house of God with them on a Sunday morning. America better wake up and realize where things actually change yet. So it's my obligation to tell you and tell you clearly that the institution of marriage is between a man and a woman. Let's get that out of the way. I won't marry two men and I won't marry two women. I ain't going to do it. It ain't going to happen because that is not the institution that God created. So if y'all was wanting that answer, you got that answer. And I know Bishop's the same way. He ain't marrying two men and he ain't marrying two women. I know my dad. So if you're wondering where do our pastor stand, that's where we stand. It ain't going to happen. Y'all can, you can put handcuffs on me and take me down to the jailhouse. That's how serious I am about it. I ain't marrying two men and two women. Well, you're divorced, Pastor Dustin. Well, I know it. 
And I'm remarried. I'm married to the right one. I'm married to one that ain't just going to decide to leave because they'd just, you know. And I'm saying all that to say this. I got a whole, I ain't even gotten to my message. That was all introduction. I'm serious. I got three more pages of notes here. I'll show them to you. Let me help y'all. This is what I tell people all the time. Divorce rate in this nation is, is approaching 60%. It's the same in the church. Matter of fact, I think it's a little higher in the church than outside the church. Because we teach people to get married because they're in love with each other. And I've been seeing all the rainbow flags and everything talking about love wins. And I'm trying to figure out what love, are, when you say love, do you mean the little butterfly feeling that you get when you look at somebody else? Because if you think that that wins, then you're fooling yourself. That don't win. Because if that won, then our divorce rate wouldn't be almost 60%. So before we point at two men saying, y'all not be getting married, because you don't get married based on where we feel something for each other. You better teach that to your kids when they're trying to marry the wrong girl or the wrong boy. You better look at the, uh, yourself in the mirror when you're looking at a man that don't want to go to church or don't pay his tithe. Come on, single girls. He don't want nothing to do with God. Don't pay his tithe. Can't listen to his boss. Can't keep a job, but I love him, but I love him. And love wins. No, it don't. Next time you're looking at that girl talking about what well, she's fine and she's this and she's that and oh my God, the way she looks to me and oh, you know, and, uh, and love wins and I love her. No, it don't win. You better reconsider. You better reconsider. Proverbs doesn't tell me that, uh, about, about this woman that just made you feel all kind of ways. Love is an action word. It's a verb, so let's clear the air on that, can we? So marriage is between a man and a woman. Train your children in the way that they should go. When they are old, they're not going to waver from it. They won't depart from it. In 1 Kings chapter number 18, the text I was going to go to, and I'm finished. Uh, by the way, Brother BJ, why don't you play it and shut me down? <laughs> we see a standoff between a prophet and political leaders. We see Ahab that had institutionalized the worship of another god. Baal and Asherah and Elijah said this he said listen let's clear the air once and for all he said let's gather everybody on Mount Car Carmel and when we get there what's going to happen is there's going to be a demonstration of the power of God and that's all it's going to take to show people who's right and who's wrong. It ain't going to be my words versus someone else's words. It ain't going to be my opinion versus someone else's opinion. In other words, when we can get to the place where we can put it all on display, here's what I want to put on display. I'm going to put on display the power of God because I understand that that's what changes people. Elijah asked the question, how long are you going to falter between two different gods? How long are you going to waver? How long are you going to straddle the fence? You, first of all, you got to pick one side or the other. And when you do and you demonstrate the power of God, that is convincing enough that God is the right way, that choosing God 
is the right path to choose, that serving God is the right thing to do. Your opinion, your hatred, your doom, your fear, that ain't going to change nobody. That ain't going to change nothing. But I'm looking for people in this hour that says suddenly everything is on display. Suddenly everything is out there for everybody to see. I'm not going to give you my opinion. All I'm going to do is invite God to show up where I am at. And God, when you show up in my life, then people can't help but look and say that's the kind of God that I want to serve things will take care of themselves I'm looking for people in this hour and of course there were things that he did he brought out 12 stones he reestablished government get yourself back into the house of God to the order of God the government of God he brought 12 stones out first Kings chapter number 18 read it for yourself he reestablished government he brought out four buckets for water and we know the north the south the east and the west he brought out he brought out all four faces of God we got to get back to a time when we rely on everything that God is listen to me everything that God incorporates not just his intellectualism not just his spirit but when the people of God realize that God is loving he is powerful God is spirit God is intelligence and then he cried for an outpouring. He said, y'all feel this thing. You, you feel these buckets of water three different times and pour it out on this altar. And then, of course, at that moment, then God was able to pour himself out. He was able to demonstrate his power. Why was he able to demonstrate the power? Because Elijah had everything in place for him to demonstrate the power. And the message to the body of Christ in this hour is God can't do nothing right now because we won't get st stuff right if we'll get back in order. If we'll get things right, if we'll get things established the way they need to be established, then God can move among his body. And when he does, people are able to see who is the true and the living God. And you ain't got to convince nobody because God can convince people all by himself. God don't need me. God don't need me preaching. God don't need Josh Hurt singing or Tim. God don't need another preacher, a Bishop Jakes, a Billy Graham. God don't need you to preach and giving your opinion. All God needs is an opportunity and a stage when all eyes are looking. And I believe that we live in an hour and an era. This ain't a setup for doom. This is a setup for God to demonstrate his power in a way that this nation has not seen in decades. I believe that the fire of God, the power of God is about to pour out on this nation. You ain't gonna have to tell people what is right and what's wrong, what institutions ought to be and what ought not to be. God can do it himself. When the people saw the power of God, Elijah looked at the people and he said, y'all take care of business. And they handled it themselves. And I believe that we're coming to an hour and to an era in this nation where not the wrath of God is going to be poured out, the doom, the terror of God, but the power of God. I believe miracles are going to happen again. Sick bodies are going to be healed. You watch what I'm telling you. Homosexuals full of AIDS and HIV are going to come and be healed by the power of God. It ain't going to take your intellectualism to change them. They'll turn to a living and an almighty God all on their own. They don't need our help. Can somebody say amen? amen? How many of you believe it? Have you received anything today? Why don't you stand to your feet? Lord, we thank you for this day that you have made. We are your people. We humble ourselves. We're nothing. We pray like Abraham prayed. As our bishop prayed this morning. Really all we are is dust and ashes. That's all we are. Before you, we are nothing, God. You are the supreme being. You are a sovereign God. We humble ourselves before you. We ask you to forgive us. We turn from our wicked ways, our own ways. We ain't worried about everybody else's ways, God. We turn from our ways. We focus on us today, our ways individually and our ways corporately. When we've been out of order within our personal life and when we've been out of order within your body and in your institution, the church, 
Forgive us, God. Forgive us. We pray this prayer, God. We pray this prayer. Forgive us. We humble ourselves. Forgive us. And God, I believe and I profess, and I believe this body does the same, that you will continue to heal this land. We pray you continue to heal this land. Heal poverty in this nation. Heal it, God. Heal poverty right here in San Antonio. Heal it. Heal inflation. God, heal the drought that we're seeing in the great state of California right now. We ask you to send rain, the rain that we've been seeing here in Texas. God, send it. There are born-again believing farmers and ranchers that live in that state, God, and we ask for you to pour out your rain. Pour out your rain, God. Bring an end to the struggle and the drought in the drought in that part of our nation where we've seen floods take place in the Midwest and the East Coast in this nation, tornadoes throughout the South and the Midwest, God, we ask you to heal our land. Heal our land, God. Only you have the power to heal us. Only you have the power to change us. And we call on you this morning. We call on you. We are your people and you are our God. We proclaim it. If you believe that, then I want you to say that. Say, we are your people, oh God. Tell them again, shout it. We are your people, oh God. Tell them again, we are your people, oh God. And I'm going to ask you, how many of you believe that this is a year that God will respond when we call on him? If you believe that, then I want you to give him a great and a mighty praise in this place. Come on, let's praise him. He's worthy.